Section 10 of Anti-Imperialist Writings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. Anti-Imperialist Writings by Mark Twain. King Leopold's Soliloquy. Part 1. The publishers desire to state that Mr. Clemens declines to accept any pecuniary return from this booklet as it is his wish that all proceeds of sales above the cost of publication shall be used in furthering effort for relief of the people of the congo state the p r warren company boston massachusetts january one nineteen o six it is i leopold the second is the absolute master of the whole of the internal and external activity of the independent state of the congo the organization of justice the army the industrial and commercial regimes are established freely by himself he would say and with greater accuracy than did louis the fourteenth the state it is i professor f cartier brussels university let us repeat after so many others what has become a platitude the success of the african work is the work of a sole directing will without being hampered by the hesitation of timorous politicians carried out under his sole responsibility intelligent thoughtful conscious of the perils and the advantages discounting with an admirable prescience the great results of a near future m alfred poskin in bilan congolais King Leopold's Soliloquy, A Defense of His Congo Rule, by Mark Twain, 2nd edition, The P. R. Warren Company, Boston, Massachusetts, 1905. Throws down pamphlets which he has been reading, excitedly combs his flowing spread of whiskers with his fingers, pounds the table with his fists, lets off brisk volleys of unsanctified language at brief intervals, repentantly drooping his head between volleys, and kissing Louis the Eleventh crucifix hanging from his neck, accompanying the kisses with mumbled apologies, presently rises, flushed and perspiring, and walks the floor, gesticulating. Blank, blank. Blank, blank. If I had them by the throat, hastily kisses the crucifix and mumbles, in these twenty years i have spent millions to keep the press of the two hemispheres quiet and still these leaks keep on occurring i have spent other millions on religion and art and what do i get for it nothing not a compliment these generosities are studiedly ignored in print in print i get nothing but slanders and slanders again and still slanders and slanders on top of slanders grant them true but what of it they are slanders all the same when uttered against a king miscreants they are telling everything oh everything how i went pilgriming among the powers in tears with my mouth full of bible and my pelt oozing piety at every pore and implored them to place the vast and rich and populous congo free state in trust in my hands as their agent so that i might root out slavery and stop the slave raids and lift up those twenty-five millions of gentle and harmless blacks out of darkness into light the light of our blessed redeemer the light that streams from his holy word the light that makes glorious our noble civilization lift them up and dry their tears and fill their bruised hearts with joy and gratitude lift them up and make them comprehend that they were no longer outcasts and forsaken but our very brothers in christ how america and thirteen great european states wept in sympathy with me and were persuaded how their representatives met in convention in berlin and made me head foreman and superintendent of the congo state and drafted out my powers and limitations carefully guarding the persons and liberties and properties of the natives against hurt and harm forbidding whiskey traffic and gun traffic providing courts of justice making commerce free and fetterless to the merchants and traders of all nations 
and welcoming and safeguarding all missionaries of all creeds and denominations they have told how i planned and prepared my establishment and selected my horde of officials pals and pimps of mine unspeakable belgians every one and hoisted my flag and took in a president of the united states and got him to be the first to recognize it and salute it oh well let them blackguard me if they like it is a deep satisfaction to me to remember that i was a shade too smart for that nation that thinks itself so smart yes i certainly did bunco a yankee as those people phrase it pirate flag let them call it so perhaps it is all the same they were the first to salute it these meddlesome american missionaries these frank british consuls these blabbering belgian-born traitor officials those tiresome parrots are always talking always telling they have told how for twenty years i have ruled the congo state not as a trustee of the powers an agent a subordinate a foreman but as a sovereign sovereign over a fruitful domain four times as large as the german empire sovereign absolute irresponsible above all law trampling the berlin-made congo charter underfoot barring out all foreign traders but myself restricting commerce to myself through concessionaires who are my creatures and confederates seizing and holding the state as my personal property the whole of its vast revenues as my private swag mine solely mine claiming and holding its millions of people as my private property my serfs my slaves their labor mine with or without wage the food they raise not their property but mine the rubber the ivory and all the other riches of the land mine mine solely and gathered for me by the men the women and the little children under compulsion of lash and bullet fire starvation mutilation and the halter these pests it is as i say they have kept back nothing they have revealed these and yet other details which shame should have kept them silent about since they were exposures of a king a sacred personage and immune from reproach by right of his selection and appointment to his great office by god himself a king whose acts cannot be criticized without blasphemy since god has observed them from the beginning and has manifested no dissatisfaction with them nor shown disapproval of them nor hampered nor interrupted them in any way by this sign i recognize his approval of what i have done his cordial and glad approval i am sure i may say blessed crowned beatified with his great reward this golden reward this unspeakably precious reward why should i care for men's cursings and revilings of me with a sudden outburst of feeling may they roast a million eons in catches his breath and effusively kisses the crucifix sorrowfully murmurs i shall get myself damned yet with these indiscretions of speech yes they go on telling everything these chatterers they tell how i levy incredibly burdensome taxes upon the natives taxes which are pure theft taxes which they must satisfy by gathering rubber under hard and constantly harder conditions and by raising and furnishing food supplies gratis and it all comes out that when they fall short of their tasks through hunger sickness despair and ceaseless and exhausting labor without rest and forsake their homes and flee to the woods to escape punishment my black soldiers drawn from unfriendly tribes and instigated and directed by my belgians hunt them down and butcher them and burn their villages reserving some of the girls they tell it all how i am wiping a nation of friendless creatures out of existence by every form of murder for my private pocket's sake and how every shilling i get costs a rape a mutilation or a life but they never say although they know it that i have labored in the cause of religion at the same time and all the time 
and have sent missionaries there of a convenient stripe as they phrase it to teach them the error of their ways and bring them to him who is all mercy and love and who is the sleepless guardian and friend of all who suffer they tell only what is against me they will not tell what is in my favor they tell how england required of me a commission of inquiry into congo atrocities and how to quiet that meddling country with its disagreeable congo reform association made up of earls and bishops and john morley's and university grandees and other dudes more interested in other people's business than in their own i appointed it did it stop their mouths no they merely pointed out that it was a commission composed wholly of my congo butchers the very men whose acts were to be inquired into they said it was equivalent to appointing a commission of wolves to inquire into depredations committed upon a sheepfold nothing can satisfy a cursed englishman note this visit had a more fortunate result than was anticipated one member of the commission was a leading congo official another an official of the government in belgium the third a swiss jurist it was feared that the work of the commission would not be more genuine than that of innumerable so-called investigations by local officials but it appears that the commission was met by a very avalanche of awful testimony one who was present at a public hearing writes men of stone would be moved by the stories that are being unfolded as the commission probes into the awful history of rubber collection it is evident the commissioners were moved of their report and its bearing upon the international issue presented by the conceded conditions in the congo state something is said on the supplementary page of this pamphlet certain reforms were ordered by the commission in the one section visited but the latest word is that after its departure conditions were soon worse than before its coming m t end of note and were the fault-finders frank with my private character they could not be more so if i were a plebeian a peasant a mechanic they remind the world that from the earliest days my house has been chapel and brothel combined and both industries working full time that i practiced cruelties upon my queen and my daughters and supplemented them with daily shame and humiliations that when my queen lay in the happy refuge of her coffin and a daughter implored me on her knees to let her look for the last time upon her mother's face i refused and that three years ago not being satisfied with the stolen spoils of a whole alien nation i robbed my own child of her property and appeared by proxy in court a spectacle to the civilized world to defend the act and complete the crime it is as i have said they are unfair unjust they will resurrect and give new currency to such things as those or to any other things that count against me but they will not mention any act of mine that is in my favor i have spent more money on art than any other monarch of my time and they know it do they speak of it do they tell about it no they do not they prefer to work up what they call ghastly statistics into offensive kindergarten object lessons whose purpose is to make sentimental people shudder and prejudice them against me the remark that if the innocent blood shed in the congo state by king leopold were put in buckets and the buckets placed side by side the line would stretch two thousand miles if the skeletons of his ten millions of starved and butchered dead could rise up and march in single file it would take them seven months and four days to pass a given point if compacted together in a body they would occupy more ground than st louis covers world fair and all if they should all clap their bony hands at once the grisly crash would be heard at a distance of blank. damnation it makes me tired and they do similar miracles with the money i have distilled from that blood and put into my pocket they pile it into egyptian pyramids they carpet saharas with it 
they spread it across the sky and the shadow it casts makes a twilight in the earth and the tears i have caused the hearts i have broken oh nothing can persuade them to let them alone meditative pause well no matter i did beat the yankees anyway there's comfort in that reads with mocking smile the president's order of recognition of april twenty two eighteen eighty four the government of the united states announces its sympathy with and approval of the humane and benevolent purposes of my congo scheme and will order the officers of the united states both on land and sea to recognize its flag as the flag of a friendly government possibly the yankees would like to take that back now but they will find that my agents are not over there in america for nothing but there is no danger neither nations nor governments can afford to confess a blunder with a contented smile begins to read from report by rev w m morrison american missionary in the congo free state i furnish herewith some of the many atrocious incidents which have come under my own personal observation they reveal the organized system of plunder and outrage which has been perpetuated and is now being carried on in that unfortunate country by king leopold of belgium i say king leopold because he and he alone is now responsible since he is the absolute sovereign he styles himself such when our government in eighteen eighty four laid the foundation of the congo free state by recognizing its flag little did it know that this concern parading under the guise of philanthropy was really king leopold of belgium one of the shrewdest most heartless and most conscienceless rulers that ever sat on a throne this is apart from his known corrupt morals which have made his name and his family a byword in two continents our government would most certainly not have recognized that flag had it known that it was really king leopold individually who was asking for recognition had it known that it was setting in the heart of africa an absolute monarchy had it known that having put down african slavery in our own country at great cost of blood and money it was establishing a worse form of slavery right in africa with evil joy yes i certainly was a shade too clever for the yankees it hurts it gravels them they can't get over it puts a shame upon them in another way too and a graver way for they never can rid their records of the reproachful fact that their vain republic self-appointed champion and promoter of the liberties of the world is the only democracy in history that has lent its power and influence to the establishing of an absolute monarchy contemplating with an unfriendly eye a stately pile of pamphlets blister the meddlesome missionaries they write tons of these things they seem to be always around, always spying, always eye-witnessing the happenings, and everything they see they commit to paper. They are always prowling from place to place. The natives consider them their only friends. They go to them with their sorrows. They show them their scars and their wounds, inflicted by my soldier police. They hold up the stumps of their arms and lament because their hands have been chopped off as punishment for not bringing in enough rubber and as proof to be laid before my officers that the required punishment was well and truly carried out one of these missionaries saw twenty-one of these hands drying over a fire for transmission to my officials and of course he must go and set it down and print it they travel and travel they spy and spy and nothing is too trivial for them to print takes up a pamphlet reads a passage from report of a journey made in july august and september nineteen o three by rev a e scrivener a british missionary soon we began talking and without an encouragement on my part the natives began the tales i had become so accustomed to 
They were living in peace and quietness when the white men came in from the lake with all sorts of requests to do this and that, and they thought it meant slavery. So they attempted to keep the white men out of their country, but without avail. The rifles were too much for them. So they submitted, and made up their minds to do the best they could under the altered circumstances. First came the command to build houses for the soldiers, and this was done without a murmur. Then they had to feed the soldiers and all the men and women, hangers-on, who accompanied them. Then they were told to bring in rubber. This was quite a new thing for them to do. There was rubber in the forest several days away from their home, but that it was worth anything was news to them. A small reward was offered, and a rush was made for the rubber. What strange white men to give us cloth and beads for the sap of a wild vine! They rejoiced in what they thought their good fortune. But soon the reward was reduced until at last they were told to bring in the rubber for nothing. To this they tried to demur. But, to their great surprise, several were shot by the soldiers, and the rest were told, with many curses and blows, to go at once, or more would be killed. Terrified, they began to prepare their food for the fortnight's absence from the village which the collection of rubber entailed. The soldiers discovered them sitting about. What, not gone yet? Bang, 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 and down fell one and another, dead, in the midst of wives and companions. There is a terrible wail, and an attempt made to prepare the dead for burial, but this is not allowed. All must go at once to the forest. Without food? Yes, without food. And off the poor wretches had to go, without even their tinder-boxes to make fires. Many died in the forests of hunger and exposure, and still more from the rifles of the ferocious soldiers in charge of the post. In spite of all their efforts, the amount fell off, and more and more were killed. I was shown around the place, and the sites of former big chief settlements were pointed out. A careful estimate made the population of, say, seven years ago to be two thousand people in and about the post, within a radius of, say, a quarter of a mile. All told, they would not muster two thousand now, and there was so much sadness and gloom about them that they are fast decreasing. We stayed there all day on Monday, and had many talks with the people. On the Sunday some of the boys had told me of some bones which they had seen, so on the Monday I asked to be shown these bones. Lying about on the grass, within a few yards of the house I was occupying, were numbers of human skulls, bones, in some cases complete skeletons. I counted thirty-six skulls, and saw many sets of bones from which the skulls were missing. I called one of the men and asked the meaning of it. When the rubber palaver began, said he, the soldiers shot so many we grew tired of burying, and very often we were not allowed to bury and so just dragged the bodies out into the grass and left them. There are hundreds all around, if you would like to see them. But I had seen more than enough, and was sickened by the stories that came from men and women alike, of the awful time they had passed through. The Bulgarian atrocities might be considered as mildness itself when compared with what was done here. How the people submitted I don't know and even now I wonder as I think of their patience. That some of them managed to run away is some cause for thankfulness. I stayed there two days, and the one thing that impressed itself upon me was the collection of rubber. I saw long files of men come in, as at Bongo, with their little baskets under their arms, saw them paid their milk tin full of salt, and the two yards of calico flung to the headmen saw their trembling timidity, and, in fact, a great deal that all went to prove the state of terrorism that exists, and the virtual slavery in which the people are held. That is their way. They spy and spy, and run into print with every foolish trifle. And that British consul, Mr. Casement, is just like them. 
he gets hold of a diary which had been kept by one of my government officers and although it is a private diary and intended for no eye but its owner's mr casement is so lacking in delicacy and refinement as to print passages from it reads a passage from the diary each time the corporal goes out to get rubber cartridges are given him he must bring back all not used and for every one used he must bring back a right hand m p told me that sometimes they shot a cartridge at an animal in hunting they then cut off a hand from a living man as to the extent to which this is carried on he informed me that in six months the state on the mombogo river had used six thousand cartridges which means that six thousand people are killed or mutilated it means more than six thousand for the people have told me repeatedly that the soldiers kill the children with the butt of their guns when the subtle counsel thinks silence will be more effective than words he employs it here he leaves it to be recognized that a thousand killings and mutilations a month is a large output for so small a region as the mambogo river concession silently indicating the dimensions of it by accompanying his report with a map of the prodigious congo state in which there is not room for so small an object as that river that silence is intended to say if it is a thousand a month in this little corner imagine the output of the whole vast state a gentleman would not descend to these furtivenesses now as to the mutilations you can't head off a congo critic and make him stay headed off he dodges and straightway comes back at you from another direction they are full of slippery arts when the mutilations severing hands unsexing men etc began to stir europe we hit upon the idea of excusing them with a retort which we judged would knock them dizzy on that subject for good and all and leave them nothing more to say to wit we boldly laid the custom on the natives and said we did not invent it but only followed it did it knock them dizzy did it shut their mouths not for an hour they dodged and came straight back at us with the remark that if a christian king can perceive a saving moral difference between inventing bloody barbarities and imitating them from savages for charity's sake let him get what comfort he can out of his confession it is most amazing the way that that consul acts that spy that busybody takes up pamphlet treatment of women and children in the congo state what mr casement saw in 1903 hardly two years ago intruding that date upon the public was a piece of cold malice it was intended to weaken the force of my press syndicate's assurances to the public that my severities in the congo ceased and ceased utterly years and years ago this man is fond of trifles revels in them gloats over them pets them fondles them sets them all down one doesn't need to drowse through his monotonous report to see that the mere subheadings of its chapters prove it reads two hundred and forty persons men women and children compelled to supply government with one ton of carefully prepared foodstuffs per week receiving in remuneration all told the princely sum of fifteen shilling ten pence very well it was liberal it was not much short of a penny a week for each nigger it suits this consul to belittle it yet he knows very well that i could have had both the food and the labor for nothing i can prove it by a thousand instances reads expedition against a village behindhand in its compulsory supplies result slaughter of sixteen persons among them three women and a boy of five years ten carried off to be prisoners till ransomed among them a child who died during the march but he is careful not to explain that we are obliged to resort to ransom to collect debts where the people have nothing to pay with families that escape to the woods sell some of their members into slavery and thus provide the ransom 
he knows that i would stop this if i could find a less objectionable way to collect their debts hmm here is some more of the consul's delicacy he reports a conversation he had with some natives q how do you know it was the white men themselves who ordered these cruel things to be done to you these things must have been done without the white man's knowledge by the black soldiers a the white men told their soldiers you only kill women you cannot kill men you must prove that you kill men so then the soldiers when they killed us here he stopped and hesitated and then pointing to blank he said then they blank and took them to the white men who said it is true you have killed men q you say this is true were many of you so treated after being shot all shouting out nkoto nkoto very many very many there was no doubt that these people were not inventing their vehemence their flashing eyes their excitement were not simulated of course the critic had to divulge that he has no self-respect all his kind reproach me although they know quite well that i took no pleasure in punishing the men in that particular way but only did it as a warning to other delinquents ordinary punishments are no good with ignorant savages they make no impression reads more subheads devastated region population reduced from forty thousand to eight thousand he does not take the trouble to say how it happened he is fertile in concealments he hopes his readers and his congo reformers of the lord aberdeen norbury john morley sir gilbert parker stripe will think they were all killed they were not the great majority of them escaped they fled to the bush with their families because of the rubber raids and it was there they died of hunger could we help that one of my sorrowing critics observes other christian rulers tax their people but furnish schools courts of law roads light water and protection to life and limb in return king leopold taxes his stolen nation but provides nothing in return but hunger terror grief shame captivity mutilation and massacre now that is their style i furnish nothing i send the gospel to the survivors these censure mongers know it but they would rather have their tongues cut out than mention it i have several times required my raiders to give the dying an opportunity to kiss the sacred emblem and if they obeyed me i have without doubt been the humble means of saving many souls none of my traducers have had the fairness to mention this but let it pass there is one who has not overlooked it and that is my solace that is my consolation puts down the report takes up a pamphlet glances along the middle of it this is where the death trap comes in meddlesome missionary spying around rev w h shepherd talks with a black raider of mine after a raid cousins him into giving away some particulars the raider remarks i demanded thirty slaves from this side of the stream and thirty from the other side two points of ivory two thousand five hundred balls of rubber thirteen goats ten fowls and six dogs some corn chummy etc how did the fight come up i asked i sent for all their chiefs sub-chiefs men and women to come on a certain day saying that i was going to finish all the palaver when they entered these small gates the walls being made of fences brought from other villages the high native ones i demanded all my pay or i would kill them so they refused to pay me and i ordered the fence to be closed so they couldn't run away then we killed them here inside the fence the panels of the fence fell down and some escaped how many did you kill i asked we killed plenty will you see some of them that was just what i wanted he said i think we have killed between eighty and ninety and those in the other villages i don't know 
I did not go out, but sent my people. He and I walked out on the plain just near the camp. There were three dead bodies with the flesh carved off from their waist down. Why are they carved so, only leaving the bones? I asked. My people ate them, he answered promptly. He then explained, The men who have young children do not eat people, but all the rest ate them. On the left was a big man shot in the back and without a head. All these corpses were nude. Where is the man's head? I asked. Oh, they made a bowl of the forehead to rub up tobacco and diamba in. We continued to walk and examine until late in the afternoon and counted forty-one bodies. The rest had been eaten up by the people. On returning to the camp, we crossed a young woman, shot in the back of the head. One hand was cut away. I asked why, and Mulumba and Kusa explained that they always cut off the right hand to give to the state on their return. "'Can you not show me some of the hands?' I asked. So he conducted us to a framework of sticks, under which was burning a slow fire. And there they were, the right hands. I counted them. Eighty-one in all. There were not less than sixty women, Benapianga, prisoners. I saw them. We all say that we have as fully as possible investigated the whole outrage, and find it was a plan previously made to get all the stuff possible, and to catch and kill the poor people in the death trap. Another detail, as we see. Cannibalism. They report cases of it with a most offensive frequency. My traducers do not forget to remark that, inasmuch as I am absolute, and with a word can prevent in the Congo anything I choose to prevent, then whatsoever is done there by my permission is my act, my personal act, that I do it, that the hand of my agent is as truly my hand as if it were attached to my own arm, and so they picture me in my robes of state, with my crown on my head, munching human flesh, saying grace, mumbling thanks to him from whom all good things come. Dear, dear, when the soft hearts get hold of a thing like that missionary's contribution, they quite lose their tranquillity over it. They speak out profanely, and reproach heaven for allowing such a fiend to live, meaning me. They think it irregular. They go shuddering around, brooding over the reduction of that Congo population from twenty-five million to fifteen million in the twenty years of my administration. Then they burst out and call me the king with ten million murders on his soul. They call me a record. The most of them do not stop with charging merely the ten million against me. No, they reflect that, but for me the population by natural increase would now be thirty million, so they charge another five million against me, and make my total death harvest fifteen million. They remark that the man who killed the goose that laid the golden egg was responsible for the eggs she would subsequently have laid if she had been let alone. Oh, yes, they call me a record. They remark that twice in a generation, in India, the great famine destroys two million out of a population of three hundred and twenty million, and the whole world holds up its hands in pity and horror. Then they fall to wondering where the world would find room for its emotions if I had a chance to trade places with the great famine for twenty years. The idea fires their fancy, and they go on and imagine the famine coming in state at the end of the twenty years, and prostrating itself before me, saying, Teach me, Lord, I perceive that I am but an apprentice. And next they imagine death coming, with his scythe and hourglass, and begging me to marry his daughter and reorganize his plant and run the business. For the whole world, you see. By this time their diseased minds are under full steam, and they get down their books and expand their labors with me for text. They hunt through all biography for my match working Attila, Torquemada, Genghis Khan, Ivan the Terrible, and the rest of that crowd for all they are worth, and evilly exulting when they cannot find it. 
then they examine the historical earthquakes and cyclones and blizzards and cataclysms and volcanic eruptions verdict none of them in it with me at last they do really hit it as they think and they close their labors with conceding reluctantly that i have one match in history but only one the flood this is intemperate but they are always that when they think of me they can no more keep quiet when my name is mentioned than can a glass of water control its feelings with a seedlitz powder in its bowels the bizarre things they can imagine with me for an inspiration one englishman offers to give me the odds of three to one and bet me anything i like up to twenty thousand guineas that for two million years i am going to be the most conspicuous foreigner in hell the man is so beside himself with anger that he does not perceive that the idea is foolish foolish and unbusinesslike you see there could be no winner both of us would be losers on account of the loss of interest on the stakes at four or five per cent compounded this would amount to i do not know how much exactly but by the time the term was up and the bet payable a person could buy hell itself with the accumulation another madman wants to construct a memorial for the perpetuation of my name out of my fifteen million skulls and skeletons and is full of vindictive enthusiasm over his strange project he has it all ciphered out and drawn to scale out of the skulls he will build a combined monument and mausoleum to me which shall exactly duplicate the great pyramid of cheops whose base covers thirteen acres and whose apex is four hundred and fifty one feet above ground he desires to stuff me and stand me up in the sky on that apex robed and crowned with my pirate flag in one hand and a butcher knife and pendant handcuffs in the other he will build the pyramid in the center of a depopulated tract a brooding solitude covered with weeds and the moldering ruins of burned villages where the spirits of the starved and murdered dead will voice their laments forever in the whispers of the wandering winds radiating from the pyramid like the spokes of a wheel there are to be forty grand avenues of approach each thirty-five miles long and each fenced on both sides by skullless skeletons standing a yard and a half apart and festooned together in line by short chains stretching from wrist to wrist and attached to tried and true old handcuffs stamped with my private trademark a crucifix and butcher knife crossed with motto by this sign we prosper each osseous fence to consist of two hundred thousand skeletons on a side which is four hundred thousand to each avenue it is remarked with satisfaction that it aggregates three or four thousand miles single ranked of skeletons fifteen million all told and would stretch across america from new york to san francisco it is remarked further in the hopeful tone of a railroad company forecasting showy extensions of its mileage that my output is five hundred thousand corpses a year when my plant is running full time and that therefore if i am spared ten years longer there will be fresh skulls enough to add one hundred and seventy five feet to the pyramid making it by a long way the loftiest architectural construction on the earth and fresh skeletons enough to continue the transcontinental file on piles a thousand miles into the pacific the cost of gathering the materials from my widely scattered and innumerable private graveyards and transporting them and building the monument and the radiating grand avenues is duly ciphered out running into an aggregate of millions of guineas and then why then blank 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 this idiot asks me to furnish the money sudden and effusive application of the crucifix he reminds me that my yearly income from the congo is millions of guineas and that only five million would be required for his enterprise every day wild attempts are made upon my purse they do not affect me they cost me not a thought but this one 
this one troubles me makes me nervous for there is no telling what an unhinged creature like this may think of next if he should think of carnegie but i must banish that thought out of my mind it worries my days it troubles my sleep that way lies madness after a pause there is no other way i have got to buy carnegie harassed and muttering walks the floor a while then takes to the consul's chapter headings again reads government starved a woman's children to death and killed her sons butchery of women and children the native has been converted into a being without ambition because without hope women chained by the neck by rubber sentries women refuse to bear children because with a baby to carry they cannot well run away and hide from the soldiers statement of a child i my mother my grandmother and my sister we ran away into the bush a great number of our people were killed by the soldiers after that they saw a little bit of my mother's head and the soldiers ran quickly to where we were and caught my grandmother my mother my sister and another little one younger than us each wanted my mother for a wife and argued about it so they finally decided to kill her they shot her through the stomach with a gun and she fell and when i saw that i cried very much because they killed my grandmother and mother and i was left alone i saw it all done it has a sort of pitiful sound although they are only blacks it carries me back and back into the past to when my children were little and would fly to the bush so to speak when they saw me coming resumes reading of chapter headings of the consul's report they put a knife through a child's stomach they cut off the hands and brought them to c d white officer and spread them out in a row for him to see they left them lying there because the white man had seen them so they did not need to take them to p captured children left in the bush to die by the soldiers friends came to ransom a captured girl but sentry refused saying the white man wanted her because she was young extract from a native girl's testimony on our way the soldiers saw a little child and when they went to kill it the child laughed so the soldier took the butt of his gun and struck the child with it and then cut off its head one day they killed my half-sister and cut off her head hands and feet because she had bangles on then they caught another sister and sold her to the w w people and now she is a slave there the little child laughed a long pause musing that innocent creature somehow i wish it had not laughed reads mutilated children government encouragement of intertribal slave traffic the monstrous fines levied upon villages tardy in their supplies of foodstuffs compel the natives to sell their fellows and children to other tribes in order to meet the fine a father and mother forced to sell their little boy widow forced to sell her little girl irritated hang the monotonous grumbler what would he have me do let a widow off merely because she is a widow he knows quite well that there is nothing much left now but widows i have nothing against widows as a class but business is business and i've got to live haven't i even if it does cause inconvenience to somebody here and there reads men intimidated by the torture of their wives and daughters to make the men furnish rubber and supplies and so get their captured women released from chains and detention the sentry explained to me that he caught the women and brought them in chained together neck to neck by direction of his employer an agent explained that he was forced to catch women in preference to men as then the men brought in supplies quicker but he did not explain how the children deprived of their parents obtained their own food supplies a file of fifteen captured women allowing women and children to die of starvation in prison musing death from hunger 
a lingering long misery that must be days and days and still days and days the forces of the body failing dribbling away little by little yes it must be the hardest death of all and to see food carried by every day and you can have none of it of course the little children cry for it and that wrings the mother's heart a sigh ah well it cannot be helped circumstances make this discipline necessary reads the crucifying of sixty women how stupid how tactless christendom's goose flesh will rise with horror at the news profanation of the sacred emblem that is what christendom will shout yes christendom will buzz it can hear me charged with half a million murders a year for twenty years and keep its composure but to profane the symbol is quite another matter it will regard this as serious it will wake up and want to look into my record buzz indeed it will i seem to hear the distant hum already it was wrong to crucify the women clearly wrong manifestly wrong i can see it now myself and i'm sorry it happened sincerely sorry i believe it would have answered just as well to skin them with a sigh but none of us thought of that one cannot think of everything and after all it is but human to err it will make a stir it certainly will and these crucifixions persons will begin to ask again as now and then in times past how i can hope to win and keep the respect of the human race if i continue to give up my life to murder and pillage scornfully when have they heard me say i wanted the respect of the human race do they confuse me with the common herd do they forget that i am a king what king has valued the respect of the human race i mean deep down in his private heart if they would reflect they would know that it is impossible that a king should value the respect of the human race he stands upon an eminence and looks out over the world and sees multitudes of meek human beings worshipping the persons and submitting to the oppressions and exactions of a dozen human beings who are in no way better or finer than themselves made on just their own pattern in fact and out of the same quality of mud when it talks it is a race of whales but a king knows it for a race of tadpoles its history gives it away if men were really men how could a czar be possible and how could i be possible but we are possible we are quite safe and with god's help we shall continue the business at the old stand it will be found that the race will put up with us in its docile immemorial way it may pull a wry face now and then and make large talk but it will stay on its knees all the same making large talk is one of its specialties it works itself up and froths at the mouth and just when you think it is going to throw a brick it heaves a poem lord what a race it is end of king leopold's soliloquy part one